What's going on everybody and welcome back to another video. Yes, I got a new camera and it is so much better than before. And we're gonna be making this beer right here, a Czech pale lager, but we're gonna be comparing pressurized versus non-pressurized fermentation to see is there really a difference in this very delicate beer, we will find out. In today's video, we are gonna really truly settle the debate for how close can a pressure fermented lager get to a lager that has been fermented the lager way. And I figured the best way to actually compare these two techniques head to head and truly see if there's any subtle differences is to use a beer that is going to be so light and delicate it is impossible to hide any flaws in. And that is something like a Czech pale lager. This is actually a relatively ubiquitous beer around the rest of the world. A well-known example of it is Budvar. The original Budvar was the original Czech pale lager. This is something that is very close to a Czech pilsner, something like Pilsner Urkel. This is a beer that occupies a zone with a little bit less percent ABV, a little bit less hoppiness, and a little bit less color than your typical Czech Pilsner. Case in point is, this is a beer that is going to be very delicate, very lightly flavored, and something that any particular fermentation differences are going to be shown in. And that's why I want to use it for this particular experiment. I tried to do this originally with my Fest beer, but I had a little bit of an issue with persistent Kvike in the, the pressure fermented batch and thus we're doing it now with a different beer. But I think that's actually for the best. Now, if you haven't heard of pressure fermentation before and you're wondering what the hell it is, it's just simply a technique where you add external pressure to a fermentation. Pretty self-explanatory. Usually it's anywhere from two to 15 PSI, depending on what you wanna do. Pressure fermentation is typically performed with a yeast, for example, like a lager yeast, that likes to ferment at a lower temperature than someone may be able to ferment it at. If you don't have temperature control, for example, and you want to make a lager, one pressure fermentation is a good way to do that. It's typically used also with IPAs um, or other dry hopped beers. Once you add your dry hops, you can lock in that aroma and keep it from off-gassing via external pressure. It's also a good way to carbonate your beer if you happen to have a unitank prior to kegging it. There's a number of benefits to it, but why does it work? The general understanding is when you add that external pressure, it suppresses the generation of off flavors that would be made uh, due to a higher fermentation temperature than the yeast is comfortable with. It also suppresses the amount of esters that will be created uh, due to that higher fermentation temperature. So you generally are going to get a very clean, neutral flavored beer out of it uh, if you add that external pressure. That's why it's most often done with a lager is because you get that neutral flavor at the end of the process and you can ferment it at a higher temperature. And uh, also as an added benefit, being able to ferment at a higher temperature means that you have a faster fermentation, which is always a good thing in most cases. The general understanding though is that it also suppresses esters from ale yeasts. Every time I fermented an ale under pressure, I've had pretty much lager-like results. So generally, if you're looking at an ale and you're trying to ferment that under pressure, just be sure you're choosing a beer that requires a very clean flavored ale yeast. If you're looking at an ale yeast and you want some more of that yeast character in there, I generally recommend not using pressure fermentation for that. And as always, with pressure fermentation, there is a little bit of an element of danger to it if you're not using the right equipment. Make sure you're always using the right equipment for the job. That is a pressure capable fermenter. So some good examples of some pressure capable fermenters are gonna be things like the Firmzilla from Kegland, the Fermenter King series from Anvil Brewing. There's also plenty of options in steel unit tanks that can get very expensive though. So things like the Spike CF5, the SS Brutech unit tank, etc. And no matter what fermenter you're using, just be sure you're always involving a pressure relief valve, specifically one that should be tuned to about 15 PSI. This will give you that safety margin that you need. It'll release any additional pressure as it builds up and prevents you from creating an accidental explosion. Also, because this is a pressurized versus non-pressurized experimental uh, brew day, we're gonna be doing a split batch. A 10 gallon batch is gonna get brewed today and split into two five gallon fermentations. One is gonna receive external pressure and the other is going to not receive any external pressure. It'll be, tr it'll be fermented traditionally as a lager. It's generally accepted nowadays that pressurized fermentation is gonna produce a nearly identical beer to a traditional lager fermentation. So I'm not really expecting to see too many differences, but I wanna find out for myself. There still is a little bit of debate out there. So before we jump into the recipe for today's video, I just wanna thank a few organizations for helping to make this video possible. The first is Northern Brewer. They provided all the ingredients for this batch of beer. Go check them out if you wanna shop for some ingredients or equipment. They're a great place to go find it. 
Secondly, Clawhammer Supply, they make the system I've been brewing on for the last two years now. Uh, great system, both 120, 240 volt, 10 and 20 gallon options available to you. So check them out. Great YouTube channel as well. I'm sure you know about that. Once again, this is a 10 gallon recipe. So if you want to make a five gallon batch for yourself, just simply divide everything in half and carry on. So our our grist is 100% floor malted Bohemian Pilsner malt from Vireman. 18 pounds of that. That's gonna get us a roughly 1042, 1043 original gravity. Um, and it should produce a very nice light colored beer with a lot of nice flavor. Uh, it's a great malt, one of my favorites. For our hops, we're using Alsaz, uh, which is your traditional Czech hop. And this is something you would make a Czech Pilsner with, and in a way we are kind of doing a similar thing, just to a lower degree. So my hopping schedule is actually very similar to a Czech Pilsner. We're targeting about 32 IBUs on this one, so it's a little bit on the more hoppy side than your traditional Budvar would be. So that's kind of what I like, and that's, you know, I don't want to necessarily make myself a boring old pale lager. Uh, so we're starting out with one ounce of saws as first wort hops. So we're adding these after we pull out the grain basket and as we slowly raise up to a boil. So at 60 minutes, we'll add one ounce of saws. At 30 minutes, we'll add an ounce and a half. And at 10 minutes, we'll add an ounce and a half. Um, it's a decent amount of hops going into this actually, but like I said, I don't really want a uh, boarding old pale lager on this one. I want this to have a little bit more hop expression just to keep it interesting. For our water, we are actually going to go with plain old untreated spring water, 16 gallons of that. Uh, with Czech lagers, you really do want to keep the water profile as very soft and as very neutral as possible. So almost nothing in it. Um, and a great way to do that is to use standard spring water. So for our mash, because this malt is a little bit under modified, um, I'm gonna go ahead and use a step mash on it. This is something you'd also traditionally do for a Pilsner. But the point of this is we want this to actually dry out a lot. Um, the these beers should be very light bodied, very lightly flavored. Uh, we don't want too much residual sugar left over at the end of the process. So I'm actually aiming for a final gravity under 1010. So I'm putting together a step mash that's gonna help bring out some extra attenuation here. So that mass schedule is 45 minutes at 146 degrees and 45 minutes at 160. Um, and then followed up by a mash out as usual. So for our use, we're gonna be using an equal pitch, one packet each fermentation of Saf Lager W3470. This is the Bohemian Lager strain. That should give us the character that we are looking for. I'm well aware that W3470 can ferment at higher temperatures than other lager yeasts, but this is also true of most Bohemian Lager strains anyway. So that's it guys, we're gonna go ahead and get Dodie in here in a second. I added 16 gallons of spring water to my 240 volt, 20 gallon claw hammer supply system and began to heat it up to that first mash temperature. As I was doing this, I went ahead and I milled out my grain and got ready to dough in. Once the target temperature of 146 degrees Fahrenheit was reached, I went ahead and I doughed in with my grist and I made sure to stir it up thoroughly and break up any dough balls that formed uh, to ensure an efficient mash. I let the mash sit at 146 degrees Fahrenheit for 45 minutes, but 10 minutes in I took a pH sample and I saw a rather high but not surprising pH of 6.07. Since I didn't really have any dark grains to bring the pH of the mash back down, a pure Pilsner malt mash is gonna be rather alkaline. So I added basically a cap full of lactic acid to the mash to bring it back down. I remeasured my pH about 10 minutes later after everything had recirculated and I saw an on-target pH of 5.47. After this, I let the mash continue on and I raised up to the next step of 160 Fahrenheit for 45 minutes and then mash out at 170 Fahrenheit for 15 minutes. After the mash out was complete and the wort was running clear, I removed the grain basket and at this time I added my first wort hops, which was one ounce of saz. As I added these hops, I set the controller to maintain a temperature just below boiling to avoid a boil over while we heated up with the basket still on top of the kettle. Once the basket was finished draining, I removed it and I fully carried on towards the boil, reaching that a few minutes later. And once I reached the boil, I started my 60 minute timer, adding one ounce of saws. 
And then 30 minutes later, I added one and a half ounces of saws. Twenty minutes later, I added my final hop addition, which was one and a half ounces of saws. At this time, I also added in a Whirlflock tablet for clarity and yeast nutrient for fermentation health. Ten minutes later, I ended the boil and I began to whirlpool the wort. So once I did that and once the trube cone had formed, I went ahead, chilled it down as far as I could get it, which was about the mid 70s recorded an original gravity of 1042. I transferred five gallons of wort to my Spike CF5 and five gallons of wort to my Anvil bucket fermenter. Once both batches had cooled down to an appropriate lager pitching temperature, I pitched one packet of W3470 into each batch. And for the Spike CF5 batch, I added 12 PSI of head pressure at this time. So now for the fermentation on this beer. It's important, again, if you're using a pressurized fermentation that you have the right equipment for it, and that involves a pressure relief valve. I am using the Spike All-in-One PRV, which is actually a really cool tool. Not only is it a tunable uh, spunding valve, which you can set to anywhere between zero and 15 PSI to allow that additional pressure to slowly bleed off while still maintaining a pressure inside the fermenter. It also allows you to add gas via the gas post. It gives you a pressure uh, gauge as well, and it also acts as a traditional airlock should you want to use it without pressure. And I will be using that in my Spike CF5 Unitank, which is capable of the pressure fermentation required. On the other hand, my other batch is gonna be in the Anvil Bucket Fermenter in a temperature controlled fermentation fridge. So for the pressurized fermentation batch, we're gonna be fermenting at 72 degrees Fahrenheit, well above a traditional lager's temperature range, and even pushing the envelope for W3470 as well. And that's gonna be under about 12 PSI of pressure. That's gonna give us that suppression of esters that we want. The pressurized fermentation is probably gonna take about three to five days max, uh, and it's at that high temperature, it's going to rip through fermentation super fast. By the time the pressurized fermentation is done, I'm pretty sure that my traditional lager fermentation will have just started. For our non-pressurized batch, our traditional lager ferment, we're going to be pitching our yeast at about 55 Fahrenheit. This is gonna get cooled down and then moved into my fermentation chamber where it's gonna further cool down to the pitching temperature. We're gonna add our yeast at 55 Fahrenheit. We're gonna let it slowly start to ferment, take about 10 to 14 days probably to actually get down to its near final gravity. Once we're close to the end, we're gonna pull it out of the fermentation chamber and bring it up to ambient room temperature between 68 and 72 degrees for what's considered a diacetyl rest, three to five days at that temperature to help the yeast clean up the byproducts that it creates during fermentation, especially during that colder fermentation, you're gonna see a lot of diacetyl. We'll perform a forced diacetyl test because I learned that technique last video, and that will help us determine whether or not there's any diacetyl left in the beer before kegging. I'm gonna keg both these beers. We're gonna add cold side finings in the form of gelatin or biofine, depending on what you wanna to use to both kegs. We're gonna lager them close to freezing uh, for about a week or two in the kegerator. And at that point, we should be ready to serve and compare the differences between the two, so I hope it works out well. If you want some alternative techniques or alternative yeasts for this one, be sure you're using a Bohemian Lager yeast. So in liquid form, that's going to be White Labs WLP 800, Y-Yeast 2124, Imperial Global, and if you want an alternative dry strain, Mangrove Jacks M84. Kind of in reverse of my previous lager videos recently, the thing to focus on is making sure you're using a Bohemian lager yeast, not a Bavarian lager yeast, because those are two very different types of yeast. Bavarian lagers are not going to attenuate as far as Bohemian lagers, and they're not going to have that same residual sugar profile, which is critical for this beer being dry enough and light enough, really, to be enjoyed as what it's designed as. It's just a snappy, hoppy, nice, crisp, light, refreshing beer. 
If you use a Bavarian Lager yeast, you'll get a similar result. It's just not going to be as fully attenuated. It'll be a little bit more sugary, and it might end up a little bit more like a German Pilsner. This is really splitting hairs at this point, but trust me, it does help quite a bit. Alternatively, if you don't want to use a lager strain, you can go ahead and use an ale strain. Neutral fermenting ale, such as US05, can make a decent uh, pseudo lager. Something like uh, a California Common Hybrid strain uh, is a great one as well. Or, if you want to go uh, a slightly different route, try using Lutra Kvike, which is a very clean fermenting Kvike yeast, which will ferment up in the 80s to 90s Fahrenheit. Just be sure you're taking into account the pH drop that will occur with that yeast, will not occur with the other yeasts. So make sure you're planning your brew day out accordingly. So I think that about covers it for our fermentation. If you guys have any additional questions on things that I didn't cover here, please drop them in the comment section and I'll get back to you when I can. Fermentation was actually very good for this beer. The pressure fermented batch unsurprisingly finished up very quickly at about three and a half days of fermentation, bringing it down to a final gravity of 1007. And for the naturally lager fermented batch, it actually finished at the same final gravity, but over the course of about two weeks. I also brought it out of the kegerator for a diacetyl rest and I actually forgot about it and left it there for a good week, which ensured thoroughly that the diacetyl rest was completed. I actually kegged both beers simultaneously and I added cold side findings in the form of biofine and later gelatin actually in order to ensure the clarity of the beers. I had them on tap relatively fast and force carbonated them. Unsurprisingly as well, the pressure fermented batch was already partially carbonated so it did not need as much CO2 for force carbonation and was ready a little bit faster. The beer is called Czech 1-2 and it comes in at 4.6% ABV and 32 IBUs. So for the appearance of the beer, these are both absolutely crystal clear pouring beautifully light pale straw colored beers with a uh, nice white, like very bright white tight bubble heads on top. Uh, the head fades after a little bit, leaves a good layer on the surface, good lacing as well. Um, overall, a very appetizing looking beer. So I poured these into identical glasses. Again, they look identical, so it's kind of hard to tell them apart, visually at least. Here in my right hand, in your left, I have the pressure fermented batch. In my left hand, your right, I have the traditionally lagered batch. The pressure fermented batch has a really distinct Pilsner malt aroma. This is a very hay-like, grainy-like character uh, with a tinge of sulfur on top of it. It's actually, 100% what I would expect. Very good. The traditionally lagered batch has pretty much, the, <laughs> this is pretty much the exact same thing. Um, yeah, no difference here between aroma. Mouthfeel is extraordinarily light. Um, not exactly as light as a light beer necessarily, but it is a very light mouthfeel nonetheless. This beer is exceptionally drinkable. Very light bodied, still has plenty of flavor and plenty of um, residual flavor on the tongue, but it is a very light bodied beer, a very easy drinking beer regardless. So let's go in for the traditional batch. No difference, absolutely no difference in mouthfeel. All right, moving in towards flavor. Maybe we'll get a difference here. So the flavor on this beer, this is about the most flavorful light beer I've ever produced, um, which is kind of hilarious considering that it's just pure Pilsner malt. This is absolutely delicious. It has a wonderful hay-like, cracker-like, 
Pilsner character with a serially undertone. There's a really nice Pilsner malt character to this beer that I haven't gotten in many other Pilsner beers. This is different. It has a serially undertone to it that is really quite welcome. I'm very happy with it. Hop-wise, the hops are coming through quite nicely. It's not at all like a Bohemian Pilsner. It has a very snappy bitterness, and that's about where it ends. There's not really too much of a hop flavor in this, um, but there is a spicy herbal component to it that is, it's present. It's, it's not really, <laughs> like if you gave it to a random person and said, hey, is this a hoppy beer? They would definitely say no, but it's really, it's there in a very, very nuanced way. I like it, it's actually very nice. There's also a rather nuanced sulfur character to this as well. Uh, the sulfur is coming through and it adds a lot. It actually adds a very authentic feeling to the beer. Um, this is something I really do like in my Bohemian beers. The sulfur character is not offensive, it's not overdone. It's just there in a note. So overall, this is actually one of my favorite light beers that I've made in a long, long time. The color is among the palest beers that I've ever produced, and the overall ABV is quite low. It's, it's kind of falling in line with the Budvar that I was kind of going for in a way, but it's actually really quite flavorful and more so than Budvar. So now let's move into the traditionally fermented batch. All right, well, there's already a slight difference. Yeah, this is actually a little bit less sulfury. It's got that same grain base. It's got the same expression of the Pilsner malt character that the pressure fermented batch has. Hop-wise, it's also about the same, but the yeast expression is where it is different, and this is really no surprise. There is a lack of sulfur character in the traditionally fermented batch. That's really not surprising because sulfur is really a byproduct of stressed yeast. And if you ferment a lager under pressure, it's going to have a little bit additional stress applied to it. And that does not surprise me that the pressure fermented beer has more sulfur in it than the traditional one. That's fine. There's actually a very slight nylon slash artificial rubber character to this. <laughs> It's uh, not exactly pleasant. It's also not exactly prominent though. So that is due, I think, to a recent switching out of a line on my kegerator to a fresh nylon line. Um, I think that that is kind of coming through on the flavor here. Outside of that, these are pretty much identical beers. This does not have as much sulfur as this one does though, and that's really the main differentiator but gun to head, I'm gonna choose the pressure fermented batch because it has that additional sulfur character. And I really, really love that in a lager. It's just a hint of sulfur. It's not overpowering in any way whatsoever, but it adds a whole lot of character to the flavor. It's not present in the traditionally fermented batch. And that's the only reason why I'm picking this one over this one. And when it comes down to it, these are otherwise identical. They really are. It's, it's really not easy to choose between the two of them if you're not really hunting for flavors. The overall beer that's produced by them is absolutely delicious. And I think if you had a slightly more complicated lager in any way, you'd actually not be able to tell the difference between the two of these in any way whatsoever. It would cover it up just enough. And to that point, I think pressure fermentation is legit. That's not really a new revelation for me. I expected these results in general, uh, but it is pretty cool to see side by side, glass by glass, exactly how different they are. And uh, it is remarkable how close you can get to a traditional lager fermenting under pressure. And you know, at a fraction of the time as well. But my opinion is just my opinion and my palate is just my palate and it's rather subjective. So let's loop in a few other folks here and see if we can get some more varied opinions on this experiment. All right, so now you've heard what I had to say about this beer, but I've lined up a panel of tasters here, starting with my lovely wife, who is going to be the first taster of the evening. Hello everyone. This is a triangle test, so what happens is two of these beers are the exact same, and one of them is the different one out. Now, you don't know which ones they are, and since they're identical in color, we could just use these cups here. Um, but 
I want you to see if you can tell which one is the unique beer. Am I supposed to do the swirly thing when I smell it? You just gotta drink them and tell me. Tell me what you think. I don't know. <laughs> That's different than that one. Okay. It's spicier. <laughs> it's got more flavor. That's the one I like. It tastes like biscuits. It's the middle one. I know what this one is. <laughs> you haven't had all three. You don't know which one has two of. This one is the different one. These two have more bite. This one's so, my favorite. It's the middle. You correctly chose the one that was uh, the odd one out. It also appears that well. you also like this one better. No, I like this one. That's the same one as this one. Oh. You just said that. <laughs> <laughs> but I like the middle one. <laughs> okay. But that is the or that is your preferred beer, and that's also my preferred beer. So I'm here with Jason. He is the owner and head brewer at the uh, local brewery we have here in Wither Pass, Drop Zone Brewing. So he is our second taster on this panel here. So, Jason, I poured you three beers here. Uh, two of them are identical, and the other one is slightly different. So just okay. let me know which one you think is the unique beer. I think one and three are very close. Okay. Number two seems to have more flavor coming through. So you think number two is the unique beer? Mm-hmm. I do. You actually number, number three, three. three. That was the unique beer. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Do you uh, do you have one that you prefer? Uh, the middle one. Yep. Yeah. Number okay. two. Uh, the the difference was one of them was pressure fermented and okay. the other one was naturally fermented mm -hmm. without any pressure. Uh, the one you picked was actually the naturally fermented batch. Okay. So. There you go. All right. Well, thank you, Jason. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks. And finally, we have my mother-in-law here, Laura, who is going to be our final taster for the evening. Yay! So I'm giving you a triangle test. Two of the beers in front of you are identical, and one is unique, although they look and taste very, very similarly. So all I want you to do is find out what is the unique beer, and which beer of the three do you prefer? <laughs> That's good. I think these two are the same and this is different. You are correct. Yay! <laughs> and which one do you prefer? I like the smell of this one better. But I think I like the lightness. This one's like a little bit more heavy. Uh -huh. This one to me is fresher. Well, more like a light beer. Well, I don't know what the term is, but yeah, I like that. Anyway guys, I hope you really enjoyed this video. And if you did, please do me a favor, hit that like button, hit the subscribe button as well if you haven't already, and comment down below with your thoughts, with your experiences. I love to read the comments and talk with you guys about brewing and beer and just, you know, all the little nuances. It's, it's really interesting. I've learned a lot through the comment section and I think a lot of people who are watching these videos can learn a lot themselves as well through the comment section. So don't hold back, let me know what you think. If you want to support the channel, please consider picking up a t-shirt or other merchandise from my merchandise store linked in the description box. Also, please check out my Patreon, my channel memberships, and if you feel inclined, the super thanks button as well. All of those things go towards helping me upgrade my channel. They help me purchase better equipment like this camera that I'm filming on right now which is just unbelievable, the difference it's making. I hope you guys are enjoying it as much as I am, even though I'm behind the camera. <laughs> if you're in the market for some gear, please check out my Amazon store where I've listed not only my YouTube gear, but also my uh, brewing gear as well. So if you're you know, looking for some new equipment, that's a good place to check out. Also, if you want to follow me on more than just YouTube, I'm also active on uh, Instagram and Facebook as The Apartment Brewer. So check those out for some more frequent content updates than just YouTube. And last but certainly not least, if you are still here, 
Thank you. Thank you for watching all the way to the end of the video. It means a lot to me. It means that my work is being appreciated by a select few and I appreciate those select few. So this one goes out to you guys and until the next one, cheers. Did I mention it's a very chuggable beer? This one. You have to drink them. But it has more foam. You have to drink them. <laughs> you can't do if that. If I'm right, I'm gonna laugh. Okay.